Welcome back to Colors of Life. On popular demand, we're continuing our conversation on missions. I have in the studio with me two missionaries with Calvary Ministries, otherwise known as CAPRO. So please join me to welcome Mrs. Charity Yolamen and Reverend Sam Putu. Thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> thank you for coming back and thank you for joining him today. Thank you. So grateful. Um, when we were talking last time, when we ended, there were so many questions coming in from people. So I thought it's only fair to bring you back. Thank you for obliging us at such short my notice. My pleasure. <laughs> okay. One of the things you've said to me is that missions work has two main focuses, one to the church and one to the unreached. Can you explain that to me? Yes. Um, the church is the sending base or the seedbed. Okay. Uh, every local farmer who plants vegetables knows that you first create a seedbed where you spray the seeds. And as they start growing, you know that if you allow all those seeds to grow together, they choke themselves, you start planting them. So the church is where God finds the men to go. There are three things missions need. Men, men, men. And women. Men pray. I know you mean, when you say men, you mean and women. I mean, <laughs> when I say men, I'm talking of the race, not the, the gender. Okay, okay. Okay, people, people, people. Okay. <laughs> people pray, people send, people go. And all those people are in the church. So mobilizing the church and empowering the church to do missions is a major challenge. Because many churches don't understand the Great Commission. Not their fault. They've not been taught. And every Christian thinks mission is for the clergy, the specialists. He doesn't see himself as an accountant, a doctor, a taxi driver, a cameraman in a studio. He doesn't see his role. His role is like going to the stadium, paying the toll gate, or the get fee and watch Arsenal and Man you play. You just stay as a fan. But I've never seen FIFA give the best fan award in any year. They give the best coach or the best player. So if you're just a fan, you just be watching in heaven. Okay. But so we want all mobilizing the church involved. is one goal. Then the people that come out to go, preparing, training them, and sending them is the second part of mission. So missionary work either with the church end mobilizing, recruiting, training, or the going and evangelizing, planting churches. Both are missionaries. And I know you have spent most of your time in that field, that part of the work. Let me talk to Mrs. Charity Yolamen. Um, you, uh, you have been on the mission field. You're married to a missionary. Yes. Um, how does being a missionary affect family life? You know, so could you have done this work if you were not married to a missionary? And do all missionaries need to marry missionaries? And then how about your children? I know I'm asking so many questions all at <laughs> once. Well, let me start from if I'm not married, whether I will still do the work? Yes, okay. because we still have uh, single missionaries that are working and covering ministries. And, and I know you told me that you got recruited, as it were, from uni, and then you accepted to be a missionary, and m marriage wasn't so important to you then. Tell me. <laughs> yes. When I got into missions as a young graduate, um, with our training, the body was go rich, the unreached. And that was our passion to see the unreached coming to know Christ. And that was the passion that, you know, pushed me on until I got married. Okay. Yes. So you met your husband. Where did you meet your husband? I met him in, in Calvary Ministries uh, on our training base. Okay. Yes. We were all recruited in 1992 to for leadership training uh, as a mission 
after some time, we, uh, the ministry recruits uh, missionaries and impact them uh, for a vision to lead new works, you know, pioneer new works to different countries or different tribes. And how long have you been married? Uh, 27 years. 27 years. And so both of you have gone out to the field. I know you've worked amongst the Kanuri, yes. amongst the Hausas, and even in Mali. Yes. So tell us about the work in Mali, for instance. I'm particularly interested in what you did with young girls and education. Okay. <laughs> when we got to Mali in 2002, um, looking at the church, uh, the Malian church was quite large in, in an Islamic environment. And when we understood it, we, we got to know that the Malian church needed training, they needed mobili mobilization, they needed um, instruction somehow. And seeing the young girls, most of the church is um, under 40. And even their pastors, you will find out that the pastors are, are, are outgrowing. So we needed to mobilize the young people. So what did you do with the young girls? What we did with the young girls, we uh, started skill acquisition and we started discipleship. Because at that time, you will find young girls marrying, Mo Christian girls marrying Muslims. We started teaching them how to keep faith with God, you know, to, to not to, uh, you know, lose faith in, in spite of uh, their, their challenges, their and challenges. with their culture sure. and economics yes. and all that. What about the school you set up? Tell us about the school. So we had to set up a, a, a senior secondary school okay. in Mali too, because in that village, they have only um, primary school okay. and junior secondary school. So and what Af village was this? Uh, Farakala. Okay. Yeah, in Sekasolo, uh, region of uh, Mali. And when they finish the junior secondary school, they have to go to Bamako to look for secondary school. Okay. And they have difficulties in finding a place. So there was a need there. There and was a need it there. And an education. Yes. And you had to learn French. Yes, we had to learn French. I love vous parler français. Un peu. Un Assez pour le travail. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about the work with the Kanuris there. Okay, uh, the Kanuris, when we walked among the Kanuris, they are majority Muslims. So we have to build friendship in order to preach the gospel. And in preaching, in making friends, trying to affect them, then we started, in order to penetrate into that culture, we started a, a clinic, a health center, you know, to attend to their health needs. Amazing. Now you needed, you, you learned Kanuri language yes. as well. So in the other place it was education and here it was health. Yes. Amazing. So um, I've been reading this incredible story of the history, over 40 year history of Kapro. Oh. And towards the end, the question I was asking myself is, are young people, you know, volunteering to go to the mission field? So, Reverend Putu, can you answer that question? Do we have young Because you are both over 50. I yeah, think. there you are. Yeah. I joined CAPRA at 23. Okay, but is that still to happening yeah, today? We still have, I met people in CAPRA who joined at 16. Okay. We have people in CAPRA now who are still joining at 20 something, 30 something. Okay, and are, these, are they coming from, where are they coming from? Universities yeah, or? Universities, some are coming with master's degree, medical qualification, engineers from different countries. It used to be Nigeria. Now they are coming from 23, 24 different countries of the world. Amazing. We're training people in Kenya. Okay. We're training people in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Okay. We have people who come with PhD, who are university lecturers, who have trained and moved into nations in academics as missionaries. Some have moved into medical. In many parts of the world where the gospel is not allowed to be openly preached, you need high-class professional to go in. And they're there, they're going. 
So we'll, we'll take a break, but when we come back, one of the burning questions people have said I should ask you is, how do I know I'm called to be a missionary? Okay. What does it take to be a missionary? So we'll tackle those when we come back. Thank you. Thank you. This is just such an incredible conversation. We'll take a break now, and when we come back, we would answer those pertinent questions. Welcome back to the Colors of Life show where we're talking about missions. We're going to ask, ask some important questions like how do I know if I'm called to missions? What does it take to be a missionary? So um, this question is for Reverend Putu. <laughs> people out there may be asking, how do I know I'm called? I've talked to young people who say, you know what? I've come to a point in my life where I'm not interested in anything else but God's will. So how does someone know if God's will for them is missions? Thank you. That's the wrong question. How do you know you are not called is the right question. So missions, the Great Commission is a command. You don't get called to obey a command. Nobody asks me, how do I know I'm called not to key, not to steal, not to commit adultery? Those are commands. Remember, it's a command, not a suggestion. We are all called, but we are called to different things. And I think not that's the same I'm things. going to, yes. Different things. Yes. Because the call of God is one of the most misunderstood concepts in Christendom. People are thinking of an ex exceptional experience, an angel appears to you in a dream with a Bible and say, God, oh, my son, to England. No, very few people get that. If you waited for that, you won't be the engineer that you are. You never had that experience. You didn't even have that experience to get married to the person you got married to. You just pursued your heart. Now, when Jesus called us, follow me, inside that call was fish for men, double. When he said, come to me, I will give you rest. He also said, take my yoke. When he said, abide in me, he also said, bear fruit. So the call of God is a double call. Okay. One is to communion and fellowship. Okay. The other is to service and outreach. They come together. Okay. But you see, how do I know I'm called to mission? Missions is a call, it's a burden. Okay. How, what are you burdened for? So there's a difference between a ministry and a call. A ministry is the outworking of the grace of God in your life. If you're an engineer, you do engineering. Lawyer, you do lawyering. But no, how do, where do you practice law is where the call comes. You can be a barrister, a judge, a private legal practitioner, a company secretary, a law teacher. Now, what makes you that is the burden. So a mission call is basically a burden to an average Christian to do something about the people who have never had opportunity to hear the gospel. It could okay. be a burden to pray, okay. could be a burden to support, could be a burden to go use your skill and develop that community, could be a burden to practically be there and reach out to them in evangelism. That's a call. So how do you know I'm called? What's the burden of your heart? But even if you don't have a burden, remember, the same way we read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We claim it. <laughs> Philippians 4.19, the God shall supply my need, we claim it. Have you ever read Matthew 28, go into all the world? Why don't you claim that? Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so Mrs. Yolame, I know, I, I can imagine that on the field, there are high points and low points. Tell us, share with us one low point so we have a realistic picture for people who may want to go to the field and also those, even those who don't go have an idea of what you go through on the field. Okay. There are many of them, but um, the lowest point is when the people you, have, you are spending your life for don't even, you know, consider the reason why you are there. They don't even give, you know, they don't even... Um, you don't see fruits. You don't, you are not seeing fruits. Okay. They are not considering what you are saying. It looks as if your work is just <laughs> in you vain. Know? And how does that make you feel? You just feel, I hope I'm not wasting my 
life in this place. I hope this is really what God wants me to do. And, and you felt that way sometimes? Yes. What was the times. high point? The highest point or the high point is when you see those people accepting Christ. I, I can, I remember in 2001, when I, uh, I saw a young boy, they were about eight, seven, nine, I was teaching in, a, in the house field. When in 2001, I saw him, he has graduated from the university and he's teaching and he's a Christian. Tears filled my heart because at that point, when I was teaching them and using them to learn how, I didn't know that one day that boy will we'll become something. Back. So you saw the fruits of your labor yes. as it were. We need to talk about finances because I'm wondering, you're a mother of two, two. children, you said. How old are they? 23 and 16. A boy and a girl. Yes. And Reverend Putu, you have three children? Yeah, biologically, two. Numerically, many. <laughs> oh, I like that. So, so a funding, let's talk about funding. So how do your children go to school, how do you pay your rent, you know? <laughs> Tell us about funding, how does it work for couples? Yeah, there are different kinds of missions. There are those you call denominational missions where the denomination like Anglican, Baptist, Methodist own the mission, put their missionaries on salary like a pastor. Okay. So they depend on salary. The problem, you can't really pay a missionary. You don't know what you will need. You go to a field to reach people. You find a need for Medicare, education. You never budgeted for that. So mission by nature is a faith venture. Okay. When Jesus sent the first mission, he said, just go. Don't bother about clothes or money. Wherever you go, I prepared help. So like I said, the Bible says, how can they go and let their sent? Finding the means to do this mission, it's part of the responsibility of the sender. We're not beggars, but you see, when you have a house help, you say, I'm sending you to the market. What does that mean? You make a list. What do you need? You give the money he needs and the transport. So God has raised senders who work along with missionaries. I have had the privilege of incredible friends who have stood by me. Some have, uh, I recall one day I got a call from outside the country, Nigerian working outside. I was just, my child, my daughter just got admission to secondary school and I was wondering, where will I find the money? My daughter said me, Daddy, why you worry yourself? Is it not, what do you do to make money? Is it not trusting God? So if it's trusting God, does it make any difference whether it's one naira or one million? Trust God, my own daughter. Mm. Two days later, I got a call to a company. They said, we've been praying for you and God said, pay school fees for your daughter. And they sent Western Union that covered not just my daughter, but the two others. Mm. If somebody woke up to me one day and said, I hear your daughter is in the university. How does he cope, your children? I said, well, God helps. So what's the fees? And I mentioned the figure, and the person gave 70%. And uh, so we've seen that happen. And that's university in South Africa. Yeah, but we've seen missionaries so much children have to drop out of school sometime. Okay. But you'll be surprised that fellow missionaries support fellow missionaries. So it's like, you know, that kind of thing. Amazing. And I do, you do have a testimony about your accommodation. Who do you want to share it? <laughs> well, when I moved back from the field, from South Africa to Lagos. I was looking for accommodation. My budget, everything I got was over my budget. And I squatted for six months, just, and one day, a friend just called me and said, come, um, let's go. I said, go where? Put me and my wife in the car, we drove to this beautiful apartment, and we didn't know what he was doing. We, walked, we had no idea what he was doing. We just went, I knew that that's, his house was in a court case. We've been praying about it, but the old tenant left. So after we went on, he said, how about this place? Do you like it? He said, yes, just took the keys and gave us. And, and this is in, this a, is in, and in a high bro area of town <laughs> where the rents are in millions a year. And I've been there eight years. Beyond that, he furnished it, gave a generator. And uh, so, but it caused me trouble because people began to say, if a missionary can live in this kind of place, he <laughs> doesn't need support. So I lost 70% of my support, oh, but I had an accommodation. 
is good. <laughs> amazing, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> but I know there have been some stories of um, some incredible stories. Take us from this book, for instance. I read something about a gentleman called Leo Bauer. Mm. I, I would love to have him on this show to mm. talk to him, where he walked in the north, you know, trying to establish a church in the north of Nigeria, in a rural area. And at a point, he even encountered lions. It almost reads like a fairy tale, but it's in this book. Yeah. <laughs> so I know it's true. Yeah, Leo was into research. He was one of our research persons. So before we go to any play, we do research. Okay. So he goes into those jungles trying to find out, okay, who is here? What do they speak about religion? And he had many experiences. Like many missionaries will tell you. That was just one of them. One was when he met a strange people speaking a strange language and they were actually threatening him. He didn't know what he was saying. He had no idea what he was saying. And the Holy Spirit said, if they ask you the next question, you don't talk, you are gone. And they ask him the next question, so he open your mouth. He opened his mouth. He didn't know what he was speaking, but the people understood what he was saying. I escorted him to where he was going. So we've seen those so kind of experiences. He was speaking, a speaking, speaking in tongues, tongues but, but the, they were understanding. Speaking the people's language. Yes. Amazing. That's well, a gift of tongue. It's not baba, baba, mama, mama, catch a robot, kill a robot. That's not a gift of tongue. <laughs> we'll take a break. <laughs> <sighs> when we come back, we'll conclude this conversation. Don't go away. As we conclude this edition of Colors of Life, we'll be asking the question, so how, what are the practical steps one takes to become a missionary? We'll talk about the work Capro is doing in other nations of the world and the mission fields at our doorstep here in Nigeria. So I know before we went on break, we were um, discussing about Leo Bauer, um, who had gone to do some intelligence work in the north and had an interesting experience but i know he's now abroad um, he went to the uk he's got a phd from oxford university tell us about the work you're doing in places like europe and the united states yeah in europe and let me say the western world okay you know that the era of missions is dying they brought gospel to us but back home they are losing the gospel. But beyond that, a lot of people from areas we consider unreached have moved into those areas. So Capro's strategy is one, work with the churches in those places to rekindle the passion for missions. Two, work with the churches in those places to reach the diaspora migrants from different religions and areas that are settling there and becoming tangible majorities. And three, work to see how we can partner with those churches to move beyond them to other places. So that's what we're doing basically in those countries. Now in some places, some of those countries are 99% non-Christian. So we are really working there to bring the gospel to the indigenous peoples and raise those indigenous peoples to reach their own people. The best people to reach any people are the indigenous of okay. that place. Okay. And I know there's um, a work as well that you're doing in the south of Nigeria to reach people who have been displaced from the north. Tell us diaspora, diaspora work. Diaspora work. Okay, with migrations and the troubles in the north, many of these migrants have filled, you know, our cities. Um, as a ministry, we decided that we are not just called to land. We are called to the people. So we are to reach the people wherever they are found. Okay. So we are focusing on the migrants in our cities. Amazing. And, and the, inter the interesting thing, Coco, is that it's making it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. When they're in their locality, they insist on being rich in their languages. Mm -hmm. But when they move down, they are able to accept the trade language. So where you needed to learn seven languages to reach people, now Hausa can reach the seven. And they accept it because they're out of their oh, comfort zone. That's the wisdom of God. Amazing. And I challenge the church to focus on them. 
Because we see them all as threats. Us, aren't they? When you come out, you yes, drive out to the church and they are our gate yeah. men, they are our <laughs> food so, suppliers. suppliers and, and, you know, and they are everywhere at our doorstep and we can reach them with the gospel. So, yeah. I made two of them as security men at the church. And I asked the church leaders, how would you feel that your security men went to hell? Mm, food for thought, very important. Now, someone out there says, I want to be a missionary, I want to go to the field, perhaps. What are the practical steps? Practical thing, what are you doing where you are? Mission does, the mission gift doesn't get picked up in a bus or a plane. If you're doing nothing here, you won't do anything there. So okay. where you are now, what are you doing okay. in developing your gifts, your skills? Missions today demand high skill. The most, the remaining parts of the world where the gospel need to go will not accept a professional clergy. They accept a teacher, an IT consultant, cameraman, barber, hairdresser, doctor. Okay. So what are you doing to develop your skills where you are? What are you doing to do ministry where you are? Okay. If you're doing nothing here, so that's one. Two, going to the mission. Jesus field, always called people out of something. Out of something. The only one that official. came out of nothing was Judas. I didn't make it. He had no CV. He was an area boy. That's the best we know. Now, mission is like traveling. You want to travel, which airline are you going to take? Which bus? So, which group or church or mission is going to where you want to go? You lay out with them, find out if you can afford the fee, the fare. What do they have to offer you? So find an agency. But first, go for a short term before you go for the long term. Okay. Then start supporting missionaries because you may need support later. And what you sow, you may what you reap. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. This mm. is where we'll end this conversation. But I'm so grateful to have had you here. Thank you, Mrs. Yola Men. Thank and, you, uh, Reverend Putu. Thank you so much. The pleasure is ours. So we've been talking to missionaries. We've been talking about mission, what we need to fulfill the Great Commission, what the Great Commission is, how we reach the unreached. We've heard experiences of people who have been there. And I hope our viewers have been as challenged as I have been. Follow us on social media. Don't forget to like us. Please share this video. This is the Colors of Life show where our objective is to know Christ and make Christ known.